It was the technology that would change entertainment forever. And its landmarks are all over New York City. 1894, uh, here on Broadway, Edison has the first commercial showing of his kinetoscope film. First place in the world where people could pay to see motion picture films. New York was already a center of publishing. It was already a center of theater, of course. The new thing was this kind of contraption called motion pictures. Did you know that the country's oldest complete movie studio with stages, costumes, and scene shops is still standing in Brooklyn? The American Biograph Studios are in the first purpose-built studio buildings in the United States, the kind of thing that eventually evolved into studios on the West Coast just for making films. New York was also the destination for the country's first major African-American film director. His name was Oscar Michaud. He spoke to issues that were real in the lives of black people at that time. Things that blacks talked about after church, around the table, at dinner. In other words, things that really were a part and part of the fabric of black life. He brought many people to the screen that uh, would never have made it in Hollywood. Their stories would never have been told. America's movie studios, talking pictures, newsreels, even cartoons all began in the city. Every frame has its own story to tell as we uncover the cinematic secrets of New York. New York was at the cutting edge of most technology. It was around the late 1890s that the tinkerers who created the first technology, the projectors, the cameras, and so forth, were beginning in New York. Moving pictures in the United States were invented by Thomas Edison, and he invented them in West Orange, New Jersey. So he made the first films in West Orange, New Jersey, experimental films in the beginning of the 1890s. By 1902, Edison realized that the situation was much too complicated. The talent didn't want to drag themselves all the way over to West Orange, so he takes a studio over in Chelsea on the west side. We have to go where the center of the vaudeville circuits are. That happens to be in New York. The vaudeville circuits, they would go all across the United States, uh, but those shows were cast, they were written, they were created in New York. Vaudeville provided actors for early films, and sometimes vaudeville performers became movie producers. Two of them, Jay Stewart Blackton and his partner, Albert Smith, opened the American Vitagraph Company here on Nassau Street in 1897. Soon, they were making plans to expand to Brooklyn. Smith was a vaudeville magician, and Blackton a quick sketch artist who amused theater audiences with the speed of his drawings on a blackboard. He realized that starting and stopping his film camera frame by frame turned drawings into live action. The first person to make drawings move frame by frame was uh, James Stewart Blackton, who made a film in 1906. He drew on a blackboard uh, two facing uh, figures, and he would erase a little bit, change the drawing, lean back, click the camera, and change it collect the camera, etc. So at the end, you saw hair grow, cigar smoke blowing, that sort of thing. Blackton eventually uh, ran the Vitagraph Studios and really devoted most of his life to live action films. But he started as a cartoonist. Blackton was too busy running Vitagraph to pursue animation further. He and Smith opened a new kind of studio in Brooklyn that had everything you needed to make a film in one location. I'm walking on one of the cinema secrets of New York. It's the auditorium of the Shalamis School in Brooklyn. But underneath me is one of the original silent film stages built by Vitagraph. It was built in 1907, which makes this place a part of movie history. The Vitagraph Studios in Brooklyn, certainly the first studio as we know it in the United States, a complex of buildings in which each building is devoted to a specialized purpose so that 
The stage is in one building, costume and wardrobe is in another, film editing is in another. That was a completely new idea. They were the first people to make films with serious Shakespearean subjects, for example, and to promote them as a product with high-class atmosphere. And you also had faked uh, newsreels. Jay Stewart Blackton uh, came up with the idea of recreating uh, but not telling the public about some of these things like Spanish-American War. What they did was they made a model of a boat and blew cigar smoke over the water and made believe that they had original film. Well, at the time, it fooled people, and it fooled people because movies were so new. In the first decade of the 20th century, Vitagraph became America's biggest movie studio. But by World War I, Newer film companies were paying stars like Douglas Fairbanks and Mary Pickford to fill theaters. Vitagraph was left behind. It was clear that they were suffering in terms of distributing their films. They had this studio, they had a studio on the West Coast, they had great catalog of literary properties. It wasn't enough. And Warner Brothers, which was this up-and-coming movie studio based in Hollywood, saw an opportunity to buy this bankrupt studio. They took over the studio in 1925. Around the same time, within months of them acquiring Vitagraph, Sam Warner saw this demonstration of talking pictures or sound pictures at Bell Laboratories. And when he saw that, he said, we've got to get this. The system that sold Warner's on sound was called Vitaphone. And the only known example of a working Vitaphone projector is in the Museum of the Moving Image in Astoria, Queens. It houses the nation's largest collection of artifacts in the history and culture of the moving image. Vitaphone recorded sound on records that were played back on a projector, physically connected to a turntable. The camera and the separate disc recording would go at the same time in synchronization. They had three or more cameras running simultaneously, so one would get the long shot, one would get a close-up, one would get a medium shot, and if you made a mistake, you had to start all over again. I'm standing in a second secret of New York in the old Vitagraph lot in Brooklyn. This is a sound stage at JC Studios, where NBC used to shoot The Cosby Show. But this was also the place where Warner Brothers perfected the sound technology that would change motion picture history. When the jazz singer premiered in 1927 with synchronized dialogue, it spelled the end of the silent era. Although Warner Brothers shot most of it on the West Coast, the Vitaphone technology came from New York. There they are, right there. That's them. Oh, yeah. Say hello to everybody. Hello, everybody. That's it. Yeah, but yeah. I wouldn't say hello to you. All right. Yeah, well, you remember you took me home last Tuesday night? Yes. And remember you left my house about 2 o'clock? Yes. Yeah. Well, after you left my home, my brother's tie was missing. Yeah. I'm not saying you took it, but it looks very good on you. Oh, well, now, just a minute. It wasn't last Tuesday. It was last Wednesday. It... In the second place, I didn't take you home at 2 o'clock. I left you home at 3. In the third place, I never took your brother's tie. But here's his porn ticket for his watch. They were making two and three shorts a week. Basically, the vaudeville and stage performers could just come over to Brooklyn from Manhattan, do their act on the film with sound, and then go back to work. Today, it's important because now these are the only surviving records of vaudevillians. The irony is the Vitaphone helped kill vaudeville because the act, instead of showing up in person, would show up in a film can. While strolling through the park one day, Marx Brothers were huge hits on Broadway. They had been vaudeville stars, and now they became Broadway stars. And then in 1928 and 1929 and 1930, they made their first films. Where did they make them? Not in Hollywood. They made them in Astoria, Queens. The movie studio in Astoria was built by the co-founders of Paramount Pictures in 1920, and it attracted silent film stars like Rudolph Valentino and Gloria Swanson. By the time the Marx Brothers made coconuts here in 1929, sound technology made it more important than ever to make films in New York. They wanted the best acting talent. The best acting talent was theater talent, best theater talent was Broadway. So they needed voices. So they needed voices. Oh. Hal Rosenbluth is the president of Kaufman Astoria Studios, which continues 90 years of state-of-the-art filmmaking in the complex that Paramount built. It sounds like it was definitely a hotbed of 
technology, of stars. Mm -hmm. It was always on the cutting edge. I absolutely believe that's, that's how it, it, it must have been here. And it continued because even when the end of the 30s came, it became the Army Pictorial Center. And so the Army Signal Corps ran it. And any moving image that you saw in the armed services was either done here or controlled out of here. So you had a, an, an entire city going on here. What does New York offer, though, that Hollywood, that Los Angeles cannot? New York offers things that no one else in the world can. You know, I think Sidney Lumet said it, where you, you can't shoot nighttime anywhere else in the world like you can shoot it in New York. And, and I think that really holds true. There is the ability for them to have a depth of talent you can capture anything you want here in New York. And there's an excitement that exists here. Most of the creative talent really enjoys working here and, and getting that sense of being able to accomplish something here in New York. As filmmakers made features in studios like Paramount's in Astoria, another director was already using New York City as a location to create a body of work unique in cinema history. Oscar Michaud spanned the silent and sound eras at a time when few African Americans played any significant role in the film business. Michaud was very competitive. He made his books long, his films long, because he was competing, first of all, with other writers of that period. He was also competing with D.W. Griffith. D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation, which was Hollywood's first mega hit, first blockbuster. But Birth of a Nation was also a hymn to the Ku Klux Klan. It was a uh, viciously racist story uh, in it. But uh, nevertheless, Griffith was a genius as a filmmaker. So he introduced new techniques, and this movie became a sensation. Independent African-American movie companies formed to counter Griffith's portrayal by making so-called race films, which showed an alternative view of black life in America. The Lincoln Film Company wanted to make a film out of a novel by Oscar Michaud called The Homesteader. But they also wanted to remove the plot line involving interracial marriage. They wanted to change that because this was not acceptable at the period. The interracial romance was, was too controversial. But for Michaud, who looked for controversial subjects, this was the heart of his novel and he refused to change it. Oscar Michaud realized that if he wanted an accurate movie version of the novel he'd written, he'd have to make it himself. So with no experience as a filmmaker, Michaud raised the money, directed the movie, and even took care of distribution. The success of The Homesteader put him on the map. He was on the way to becoming something like his own studio, writing the scripts, directing the movies, dealing with distribution. But in the context of, of that, those times, it was an extraordinary achievement. That tall Negro did this. He wrote the scripts based on real people. He often shot on location in people's homes. So this kind of enhanced the reality of the stories he was trying to tell. The audience could see themselves as they are and in their own surroundings. Here's the secret of New York at 132nd Street and 7th Avenue. It's a theater used by the Lafayette players created in 1913 as a showplace for African-American actors. Many Lafayette players appeared in Michaud's films in better roles than the stereotypes offered to black actors at the time. The film industry that Michaud was entering when he made The Homesteader was one in which, on the screen, blacks were dealt with as fools, dummies, cr criminals, or menaces. Most of the time, black roles were played by white actors in, in, in blackface. So there were no black directors, producers, editors. Not that they didn't exist, but MGM would not have hired them, or Warner Brothers, or Columbia. It was difficult for um, a black person behind a camera to shoot anywhere in New York. I mean, you, you, you weren't supposed to be behind a camera. You weren't supposed to have all these actors out there you're directing. When he's shooting in front of somebody's house that he doesn't have permission for, they're a little concerned that, you know, they're going to send the police out after us. But he's quick with it, right? And everybody knows what they're supposed to do. And it happens, and then he's, he's gone. He shot in nightclubs. There are tracking shots of his characters coming up out of uh, Penn Station and the whole downtown area and going uptown. I think this is a tribute to Michelle, the entrepreneur, the competitive individual that he was. He believed he could do anything. 
When the U.S. suffered a series of race riots in the summer of 1919, Michaud confronted the issues head on in his films. The silent film, Within Our Gates, dealt with the prejudice and violence of a segregated country. What Within Our Gates dealt with in the last third of the movie is a lynching of a black couple, an industrious, hardworking husband and wife who are falsely accused of a crime. A mob gathers, they are lynched. One of the most powerful and graphic depictions of lynching ever put on film. Also, uh, Within Our Gates um, has, a, in part, the attempted rape of a black woman by a member of this mob that, that lynches her parents. So in other words, uh, what uh, Michelle was dealing with was a, a kind of the, the hidden secret of segregation, namely the sexual aggression in the South against black women. Very daring to talk about at that time, maybe any time. Michaud continued to make films for 30 years, spanning the silent and the sound era. He toured the country, promoting and distributing the movies himself. Always on a shoestring budget, Michaud couldn't keep up with the production value of the major studios, and his final film in 1948 was a failure. But his life was an inspiration. I think Michaud was a model for independent black filmmakers today because he did it all. He distributed, he wrote, he directed. He was a man who, whose accomplishments were extraordinary. He made more than 40 movies, who captured black life on film at a time when no one else was doing so, who dreamed bigger than other people dreamed. Looking at him in the context of his own time, had he been white, he would have been Cecil B. DeMille or David O. Selznick, but he didn't have the opportunity. Had Selznick or DeMille been black, they might have been Michelle. By 1930, most feature filmmaking had moved to Hollywood, but some types of film production never left New York City. Newsreels were one of them, and an even more specialized part of the movie business, cartoons. The publisher, William Randolph Hearst, one of the most important New York filmmakers, the creator of several different motion picture newsreels, and then, because he had cartoons in those newsreels, he moved those cartoons onto the screen in a series of animated cartoons. The newsreel cartoons had to be made quickly, and in 1914, a cartoonist for the Brooklyn Eagle newspaper named John Bray figured out how to speed up the process. Early film animation like Windsor McKay's Gertie the Dinosaur was elegant but time-consuming. Bray's new animation studio on 26th Street used a clever shortcut. When Windsor McKay made his films, he had to draw the background and the character over and over again on hundreds of drawings. This is a lot of work. So what Bray did was to remove the character from the background by inking it onto a transparent cell, celluloid, so that you wouldn't have to draw the background over and over again. You could isolate parts of the character so that only that moved, maybe just the mouth. It's been said that John Bray was the Henry Ford of animation, and it's true. So now money could be made profits could be made. So there was a, a lot of interest in animation after that. Bray's studio went into high gear and other studios based in New York City quickly followed. In the early 1920s, Pat Sullivan and Otto Mesmer created the first real cartoon star, Felix the Cat. There were Felix dolls, Felix toys, there were books, there were comic strips, there was even Felix clothing. Felix was the biggest star, the biggest international cartoon star of the 1920s, and he was on a comedic level and a, a recognizable level with audiences as much as Chaplin or Keaton. The thing that made him a personality was he showed that he was thinking. He would have a problem and wonder how he's gonna solve it. He'd pace up and down and, and click, you know, snap his fingers, and he'd have a solution. And very often the solution was to unscrew his tail. He was an innovative, he was creative, and people got involved with him, so he became a personality. Two brothers named Max and Dave Fleischer, who'd worked for John Bray, opened their own studio in New York, where they created a host of cartoon characters, like Coco the Clown, Popeye the Sailor, and a heartthrob named Betty Boop. Betty Boop was modeled after a 1920s flapper, complete with garter belt and sexy outfits. Come to think of it, I'm gonna spill a secret about you, Betty Boop. 
Betty Boop started life as a voluptuous dog. <laughs> in her first two or three or maybe four films, she was literally a dog <laughs> because she had long ears and kind of a, a snout, and but a woman's body. So it was a very strange looking character. After those first films, they changed her face and made it prettier and the, the long ears became hoop earrings. Betty Boop was risque for the animation. And uh, by the, the mid-1930s, they toned that down when the Hollywood code of decency came in. And uh, she got a slightly different costume. And they got rid of the garter on her leg. And uh, they gave her a nephew, which made her respectable. What was really making cartoons respectable was sound. If animators wanted to compete with film, they needed their characters to talk, and no one grasped that more quickly than Walt Disney. The person who put sound for cartoons and on the map was Walt Disney with Steamboat Willie in 1928. Disney had made two silent films before that, but recognized that what had happened with the Warner Brothers and the jazz singer, this revolution in technology, was something that he'd better get on the bandwagon with. It was a very wise decision. So here's a cartoon secret. When Walt Disney made Mickey into a talking mouse, he had to come to New York. The sound technology was here, not California. In 1928, Steamboat Willie played at the famous Roxy near Times Square, the largest theater in the world. Animation is now pervasive in every form of entertainment. Uh, you can't make a film today without some form of animation. And everything that's done on the screen is usually requires some kind of artwork, computer technology, and it all overlaps. I always feel that animation is always going to be here. It's never going to go away. In the 1950s, feature filmmaking began to drift back to New York. Better sound technology, smaller cameras, and new directors made it possible to leave Hollywood studios for the streets. All of these things are coming together to make possible the revolutionary idea of filming New York City, not by recreating it in a Hollywood stage, but by actually going out into the streets of the real city. These new guys in New York were experimenting with all kinds of crazy things. They were using telephoto lenses. They were using high-speed film stock that was letting them shoot with available light, sometimes at night. And they were pioneering a whole new way of making films. New York is where we have nonfiction films starting, experimental films, indie films, television production starting here. It keeps changing. It changes according to the development of the industry. By the, the Early and mid-1960s, there was a lot of energy in, in the New York film industry, but it remained really hobbled by one huge obstacle, the city of New York. The actual government of New York uh, did not make it easy to shoot on the streets of New York. In fact, they made it incredibly difficult. You had to get six, seven, sometimes eight permits from different agencies to do the various things you wanted. That suddenly changed. Our efforts to make New York City a film capital or the film capital of the country are on the road. In uh, May of 1966, okay. when a new mayor, a newly elected John V. Lindsay, did something radical no city in the world had ever done. He created a special office, a special agency, whose sole purpose was to make it easier for filmmakers to work in the city. The creation of the Mayor's Film Office was a spectacular success. There had been 11 films in total made in New York in 1965. Suddenly, the following year, there were 40, 50 films being made, 60, 70 films being made. By the time Mayor Lindsay uh, left office, which was seven years after he had created this office, 366 films had been made in New York City. The 1970s was a busy time for feature films in the city. Directors like Woody Allen, Martin Scorsese, and Spike Lee all chose the streets of New York over Hollywood. Today, this town is busier than the days of Vitagraph over a century ago. New York is, without question, you know, the second most important filmmaking capital in the United States. More films are made on the streets of the five boroughs of New York than in any other city of the world, including Los Angeles. The history of filmmaking in New York, which goes back to the 1890s, is unbroken. 
what New York can offer is not only this heritage and this infrastructure, but we have the ability to combine new technologies with an understanding of a new audience. So the future of the moving image in New York might not be on a moving picture screen, it might not be even on a television screen, it might be on some handheld device. And if it is, it's probably also going to be pioneered in New York. If Thomas Edison could see what his moving image has become, he'd probably invent something even better. Everywhere you turn in this high-speed city, there are people ready for their close-up and ready to tell their secrets. You just have to know where to look for them. If you wanted an elegant and well-poured cocktail at the turn of the 20th century, there was no place like the great saloons of New York City.